Hello, everybody. You're welcome again to our supply chain management series. My name, as usual, is Dr. Ia Ezebasi, and we will be dealing with storage of health commodities. Very, very important topic as storage helps us to elongate the lives of commodities, um, helps us to have a kind of wide maximum stock and all that. Very interesting topic. So by the end of this session, I would like for you to be able to explain the guidelines for proper storage of health commodities, identify product related problems commonly found in warehouses or clinics, you should be able to describe special storage considerations for program specific commodities. You should be able to explain what a physical inventory or count is and when it should be done. Then you should be able to explain visual inspection and how it is conducted. So what is this? Somebody remind me again, what is this we are looking at? It's the logistics cycle and why are we looking at the logistics cycle today we are looking at it because we want to see the role of product storage in supply chains can you tell me where you can see storage it is under inventory management and you know that uh, products are being stored at every facility in the pipeline. So almost everybody that is working in the supply chain is responsible for product uh, storage, regardless of whether the facility is small, or whether the facility is big. The main operational activities for storage are the same. All right? Okay. So what are the key storage activities that happen in um during storage or storage facilities um we receive uh, supplies and uh, we do incoming inspection we put away the uh, commodities that have arrived we pick them we pack them we ship them those are key storage activities that take uh, place so why do we need to store products what's the purpose of storage we need to do that because number one you need to protect the quality of the product as well as its packaging throughout the supply chain then you also need to make the product available for distribution it's twofold yes you are protecting the quality of the product but remember that you're also protecting the packaging because that is where you have information about the product on the packaging it's expiry batch it's lot number you know um what else uh batch number lot number expiry date and all that then also you are storing things because you want the product to be available whenever it is needed you want it to be available for uh distribution all right so um the manufacturers usually design the package to protect the product. So we are this, we are we are concerned with the product quality and also with the product of the packaging. Because if you have bad packaging, the packaging may get spoiled and you would lose very important um information. All right. So one of the things that is can affect the uh one of the things that is affected by poor storage is the shelf life okay and uh the shelf life when it is not long enough can affect the usability of that commodity all right so the shelf life is very very important what is even shelf life shelf life is the length of a time a product may be stored without affecting its usability safety purity or potency of the item assuming that the recommended storage conditions are met, all right? So it's the length of the time a product can be stored without affecting all these properties, all right? So having looked at that, you should know that each commodity has a kind of um, specified shelf life 
And similar products may have different shelf life, especially if they are produced by different manufacturers. So you may see a CD4 kit by manufacturer A, the shelf life is one year. The same CD4 kit, but is produced by man a manufacturer B, has a different shelf life. You should not be surprised by that. So do you know how shelf life is determined by the manufacturer? Usually they carry out time and quality studies, they expose the product to typical storage conditions, and then find out uh, to what length can it be stored and still retain its uh, potency, all right? So if it's a new product, usually they send it with a shorter life until they've done full studies uh, from it. So maybe if it continues being used for some time, they can increase the shelf life as more data comes in. And you should know that the same product produced by the same uh, manufacturer could have different shelf lives in different countries. For instance, in a country that is very hot, you know, or very humid, you find out that the shelf life may be shorter because it's different from, you know, the conditions where the manufacturer produced it and tested that it should be used. So a country may decide to shorten the shelf life for some commodities, depending on their own um, temperature, humidity, and uh, all that, all right? So they have policies. So what are the basic questions that we should be looking about on shelf life? How important is expiry dates? What is the effect of storage on usability of products? Why is shelf life important for lab commodities? And what is the effect of storage on condition of lab products? Well, <laughs> this, <laughs> you know why I'm laughing? Because uh, my first son, he usually does this to us. Whatever he's taking, whether it is a mineral, it's a biscuit, something that you should actually sit down and enjoy yourself. He allows you when you are halfway through it, then you say, mommy, it's like this drink expired last week. And I'm like, what? Why didn't you tell me before I started eating it? And it's like, well, you should always check for expiry dates. And I'm like, yes, but please, I've already drank half of it. What do you want to do? <laughs> That's why I'm laughing. So the uh, expiry date is very important. Why? Because it can um, affect the safety of the product. And for safety precautions, you should consider that the expiry date that is on the product should be the last day the customer should use, you know, that product. And uh, the, if you do not have good storage, the usability of a product may be affected if storage conditions are not met. For instance, if you have high temperature, high humidity, there are some drugs, some um, laboratory agents, they say don't expose to sunlight, or don't store in humid areas, or store between two to eight uh, degrees centigrade and all that. If those conditions are not met, the usability of that product may be affected. You could have other things like microbial contamination, you know, even on cleanliness, you know, you keep the reagents in a dirty place. One other thing just runs and enters into the reagent or another, um, Another lab reagent runs and entered into it, you know, and all that. It now react and form something that you don't even want to use. All right. So those are the things. So why is shelf life important for life commodities? I think I've answered that. And what is the effect of storage condition for lab products? I've told you that if the storage conditions are not met, you may have a um, problem using that uh, uh, product. All right. Okay. So, if we do have that, you should know that in medical laboratory science, because of the kind of reagents we use, most of the reagents we use are derived from blood products or their blood products themselves. Uh, some of them are animal tissues that require very strict, you know, temperature requirements and all that. So you actually need the right temperature and maintaining quality diagnosis. Any little change in storage conditions may begin to give you results that may make you to diagnose people with diseases that they should never have been diagnosed with in the first place. 
And if they're able to find that out that you are the cause of that, you can be sent to court, you can be sued. So you need to be very careful because you're dealing with people's lives. For example, if a blood control is hemolyzed in storage and you use it to calibrate instruments, it will lead to errors and you know inappropriate results. Imagine someone is comes for a HIV uh, test and he's not positive, but he says, okay, I just want to come and do checkup. And because you have not stored your reagents very well and they have become bad, you now uh, 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 carry out the test and the person is positive. In fact, everybody that came for that test while that kit was being used, all of them that becomes positive. Imagine the chaos that you have caused in people's lives because of what bad storage. So we don't want to go through that, all right? So we are going to continue our discussion on the proper storage. Um, there is a small book talks about guidelines. It's blue in color, guidelines of uh, uh, storage. I've also given that to you, a soft copy, please. I want you to go through that guidelines for proper health storage so that you do understand the remainder of what uh, I have to say. But I hope that I will be able to make all things clear, even if you don't look at the book. But I would really, really, really insist that you try and look at that book for in-depth details on how to store our ducts. And when we study this, we should be able to make small improvements in storage, which will have a positive impact on maintaining proper storage conditions, and therefore will help to maintain product quality. So what are these um, storage guidelines? First of all, you should be able to clean and uh, disinfect a storeroom regularly. You do know that rodents and some insects like termites, cockroaches, they love health commodities. <laughs> they also love to eat the cartons and the inner packaging. So you need to actually keep your room pest free because if your storeroom becomes infected with pets, your products, you know, may be destroyed. So there are different ways. You could use insecticides, you could use pesticides. Uh, if you don't like insecticides and pesticides, go and get a cat that will catch all the rats, the cockroaches and all that, okay? And please, if you are running a warehouse, try as much as possible not to eat in the warehouse. Why? Because pieces of food that may drop may, you know, encourage pests to visit your storeroom, all right? So keep your storeroom clean. That should be very, very easy, cost effective. You don't need to spend anything, just energy. <laughs> So also you should be able to store your health commodities in a dry, well-lit, well-ventilated storeroom out of direct sunlight. This is because if you do not do this, if the store gets hot, the heat may increase some of the, uh, or may cause some of the products that you're keeping to get spoiled, especially if they are protein-based, you know, commodities, all right? For uh, example, like latest products, latex, like your gloves, you know, and all that, if you keep them at temperatures that are above 40 degrees centigrade, you may find out that their shelf life will reduce. That is why sometimes when you open a pack of gloves that have not been well, you know, uh, stored, as you open the glove, the glove tears or the glove becomes so gummy, you can't even open it, you know, those are some of the things. If you cannot afford an air conditioner, nothing stops you from keeping, you know, a standing fan. If you still know that there is no light, you can build your warehouse in such a way that it forces ventilation. You should encourage a cross a ventilation. You should also build your storeroom in a way that direct sunlight does not enter into the store to damage your products, all right? And if sunlight is entering, please move the commodities away from that window where there is no sunlight. Then you should be able to secure the storeroom from water penetration. Why? Because when water enters or comes near the commodity, it can destroy either 
the commodity or the packaging. And you know that if the packaging is damaged, the product becomes unacceptable to the clients because you, you, you don't have your information on the box that you should actually have, all right? Um, also, if water still penetrates, you could actually lift your, uh, when you're storing, you stack it in such a way that it is off the floor for at least four inches or 10 cm off the floor or one foot or 30 cm away from walls. You know that some of the walls can, moisture can seep through the walls, okay? So you need to remove the product away from the walls and up from the ground, all right? The third thing you should do, or the fourth thing you should do, is to ensure that fire safety equipment is available and accessible and that the personnel are trained to use it. This is very, very important. We should not joke with this. You know, sometimes we do things for show. And when a crisis happens, we are not able to take care of that crisis either because this fire safety equipment is not working or it is there and the personnel don't even know how to use it. All right. I remember there was an actor, a Nigerian actor, that they were uh, doing a fire scene. And uh, when it was time to put off the fire, they found out that the safety equipment was not working. That guy got burnt up completely, you know? So please, we should have uh, fire safety products very near because you may say water will work, but water only works for, um, you know, ordinary fires. When you come to chemical fires or when you come to um, electrical fires, water may not be able to off it. You need this fire safety um, equipment. And you should also know that when you come to medical laboratory products, you have products that are very, very flammable. They are corrosive. They are toxic. So you need to have that at hand to be able to take care of anything you know that happens. Then you should be able to store latex uh, products like gloves away from electric motors and fluorescent light because this is because fluorescent lights and electric motors, electric motors produce a zone which affect the quality of the gloves. A while fluorescent light affects the gloves directly, this can spoil the gloves, reduce their shelf life and their usability. Then you want to make sure that you maintain cold storage, including a cold chain for commodities that require it. This one you cannot compromise at all. That is because most of the reagents, like I said, are blood-based, they are protein-based, so they need to be kept at a certain temperature. Even when transporting them, you need a cold chain to be able to transport these uh, products. In fact, if you do not use a cold chain, those things may not even last up to a month. Month is even talking about too much. Well, let's say it may not even work to a month. So you may say cold chain, cold chain, cold chain, there's no electricity. Yes, there's no electricity, but there are things called uh, bottle gas, or you can use kerosene powered refrigeration. All right. If you don't have that, you could, like, if you're transporting it, you could use what is called dry ice. Dry ice, you 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 put it in the what do they call that thing? A cooler. Uh-huh. A cooler, insulated cooler. Then you put ice packs, dry ice inside there. Then you put the kits and cover it and seal it before you transport it. I think that dry ice can take up to 48 hours if they were well frozen before the journey started. All right. So you need to have a very good old chain. Then you should, um, anything that is flammable, is toxic, uh, flammable products, separate them, store them separately. Don't store them with other things. Put them one side. Use the manufacturer safety data uh, sheet and store them the way they should be uh, stored. Even though I've not put this on the line. Also, you should limit access to that storage area. It's not everybody that comes to the store that must enter. Uh-uh. Your relative comes, he enters the store to come and see you. 
Some of these, sometimes children from school, they come in, you allow them to enter, and you know how things can be. They can peel far, they can touch what they are not supposed to touch, kick down what they are not supposed to kick, and all that. Please and please, only people that are trained to handle these uh, control substances, these toxic substances, and all that should be allowed to enter into that room. In fact, some of these store rooms, you are even supposed to stay there with protection, PPE. These people enter, you know, without all that. And, you know, they endanger both themselves and the products that they are keeping. All right. The next one is that some laboratory commodities can contain things like um, cyanide and need to be carefully disposed. If you know what is cyanide, you don't want to be playing with it at all. It's very, very lethal. So like some of these laboratory commodities that contain cyanide, you need to keep them very carefully. And then if they need to be disposed, you need to follow guidelines. There's guidelines for disposing these things. You need to follow those guidelines very, very carefully to avoid poisoning the whole community or the whole area where those things are dumped. You know that people go to these dumps, pick up things. You should be able to have an incinerator if it's an incinerator that takes care, that takes care of all those things. All right? Okay. So another is that you should arrange your cartons in such a way that the arrows should point up, ensure that identification labels, expiry dates, manufacturing dates are all visible all right so you store them the arrow should pointing up don't store reagents upside down they can leak or oh, you store them on their side <laughs> they can leak and you know by the time you want to carry out the test you find out that in fact one of the most important reagents has leaked out so the whole kit you cannot even use it all right we want to avoid that okay then you should store the supplies in a manner that is accessible to FEFO, counting, general management, all right? So what is FEFO? FEFO means first expiry, first out. That is, you arrange it in such a way, you know. <laughs> this reminds me of uh, my girl in the house. Usually if you buy... Uh, new things. She carries the old ones and keeps it where she will not find it and starts using the old, the new things before the old ones, you know, before using the old ones. If she remembers, sometimes by the time she gets back to the old ones, find out that they are spoiled and uh, that is wastage. So you should store it in such a way that the ones that will expire first should be kept where they will be used first. All right? And the ones that will have a longer expiry date should be kept where after the ones that are expiring are used first, then they come in next. Do you understand? All right. Then you need to also store medical supplies separately away from insecticides, chemicals, old files, opry supplies, uh, no, and all that. Okay. So why do you want to do this? You do know that insecticides and uh, other chem they are chemical products, and you know that chemical products, they, what do we call it? They have reactions, you understand? They can react with one another and such reactions may reduce the life uh, shelf of such a product. So you need to keep them away from health commodities. That was why I was saying that if you need to get rid of pests and you find out that insecticide is not good enough, you can get biological control like cats and other things that can take care of these things, okay? So, you have to um, keep those things away from each other. Uh, the alcohol, keep it away. The mineral spirits, keep it away. You know, keep those things, arrange them in such a way that similar products are close to each other. Like those ones that are flammable, keep them near a fire extinguisher so that if anything gets uh, on the hand, you can take care of that and all that, okay? Then when some products become damaged or expired, please separate and dispose of that damaged or expired products without delay. But when you are disposing of it, you should know that there are guidelines to disposing. If you, 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 you have 
um, a program, there is a particular guideline they use for disposing it. Don't just say it is expired and you throw it away. They will catch you and they will jail you for theft and fraud. All right. So you follow the guidelines for disposing. We have to keep the packets somewhere, maybe snap them and send, you know, with some documents and all that. All right. So these are all the guidelines and we have seen some of these guidelines are policy, you know, uh, policy, uh, need policy decisions. Some of them you can take decisions at the facility levels. Some of them you can implement them at no cost. Some of them involve a lot of costs. Some of them involve very minimal costs, all right? So I want you to look at these guidelines and decide which ones do you think are very expensive? Which one do you think are low cost guidelines? Which one do you think don't even need any costs at all? And then share your answers with me in the chat. So while I'm waiting for you to do that, please, as you watch, subscribe to our channel and like our video if you like what you are seeing and hearing. All right, so having looked at um, each of these guidelines, I want to ask which of them do you think is a policy or facility level decision or action? Which guideline can be followed or implemented at low cost? And if the implementation of the guideline involves cost, can it be done at low cost? How? I want you to think, you are managers, I want you to begin to think of these things, all right? So, having said that, we should know that some solutions are very expensive, okay? Like uh, when you have water leakage, sometimes if the water leakage is so bad, you may have to replace the whole roof, okay? So, it will require both cost, it will require physical and structural changes, all right? Other solutions are within the storekeeper's ability and they are low cost. For instance, keep your uh, storeroom clean, sweep it. Doesn't take you any cost. You are paid a salary to do that. Keep it clean, all right? So it's low cost or it's even no cost at all. And it can help you to protect the shelf life. If they say stack it up, you need to stack it at a, at a particular level, lift it up from the ground. Don't allow it to touch the walls. Please shift it from the sunlight. All those things are low cost things, okay? But when you begin to look at things like uh, cold chain, cold chain will require a lot of costs, you know? So locking security rooms, there are some facilities, especially at the village level, at the rural level that you may not be able to have, you know, all those cabinets for locking and other things. Those could require, you know, some uh, costs. So those things, all right? So having looked at uh, all that, what is the special storage consideration that you should have? What specific challenges are related to the guidelines that you've chosen? What is the consequence to supply chain and commodity availability if you identify storage problems that are not address timely or adequately, all right? For instance, if your security is not working very well, people will come in and steal it. So you need to start planning on having some form of security. If you cannot have, um, there's this security that, that when, you, when you come in, the thing has to scan your face, you know, scan your face, scan your eye, biometric identification before the door opens. That is on a very high level, okay? If you cannot afford that, please put, uh, what do they call this thing? Protect us on the door. Lock it very well with this. If you still cannot afford that, lock your door as it is. If you still cannot afford that, then have cabinets that can lock. Whatever it is, make sure that security works. Then for cold chain, cold chain may be another problem because, yes, they may be refrigerators, but there is no light, you know? to power the refrigerator. Even the ones that don't need refrigerator, there are some uh, uh, products that they say store at room temperature, but the room temperature in Europe 
is the same from is different from the room temperature in Nigeria. The room temperature in Nigeria is about 33 to 35 on a good day. Like now, I am actually feeling very hot. The sun is like hot. Okay. But they are abroad, their own room temperature will be between 22 and 25. So you need air conditioners, you know, to keep the room cool, not cold itself, in cool. You understand? That can be a problem. So in that kind of case, you may need air conditioner, and we are still talking about electricity wahala. Even if you are powering generator, <laughs> uh, let us not talk about that one. Uh, okay. <laughs> So, when you are planning, you know, for a program, you must put all these things into place, okay? So, maybe if you are not going to have a um, freezer that is powered by electricity, you can plan for, you know, kerosene-powered, you know, free refrigerators, or plan to use reagents that don't need to change. I don't know. So, Another problem you may face is despite, uh, disposal of your expired products. Some of our facilities don't have dedicated places, incinerators, uh, this, uh, disposal drugs um, that can take care of the kind of poisons we deal with in the lab. You understand? And sometimes most of these things are taken and they are thrown into the the general does things. People that pick up these things, you know, go and pick things from the trash. Those people can get poisoned or infected or some other thing. So we need to actually think out about how we want to dispose of uh, expired uh, products. All right. Then short shelf life may also be a problem. Like I'm saying that the manufacturer's conditions may be different from our own conditions. All right, so the shelf, shelf life when they come to our own country may become shorter because of the high temperatures, the high humidity, unstable electricity, so on and so forth. So usually like, for example, let's use latex as a, an example. Latex usually has a shelf life of four years. Some HIV kits and lab reagents have shelf life of six to 18 months, all right? But... For controls, the shelf life is only three months. So you have different products with different shelf life, short shelf life, long shelf life. So you need to also make, uh, make a way for those things, all right? Then if you have different products that have different uh, shelf life, also you also may have a problem. Because those that can stay longer may not last as those that can stay shorter. And sometimes you need all of those things to carry out one particular test. So those are some of the challenges that uh, we can face. All right. Other, I think I've dealt with um, all this. I've dealt with that. Yeah, 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 yeah. I have, I have dealt with this. So, if you do not have any question, we are going to go further. If you have a question, put it in the chat box. I'll get back to it later. But most times for us to be able to look at the storage, look at which product is expiring, storage guidelines and all that, we need to have, you know, our stock level in absolute terms. And like we said in the last video, if you had watched it, that the... Absolute terms can be determined by doing what is called a physical inventory, all right? So what is a physical inventory? We had already defined it in the other lecture as the process of counting by hand the total number of units in each commodity in your store or health facility. I remember saying that you should be there physically to be able to do it, all right? You have to be there counting by hand, look at which one is usable, and which one is not uh, usable, all right? Then, what is the purpose of physical inventory? You want to compare the actual stock you have on hand for each commodity with what has been recorded in the stock card or in the bin card. So when should you do a physical inventory? You should actually do... Um, you should actually do a physical inventory at least... Um, once 
in a year, but if you find out that your program has a problem of um, discrepancies between actual balance and what is in the stock records, you should do it even much more frequently, all right? Uh, for the HIV AIDS commodities, what we usually do is that every two months, do a physical inventory. Another thing we need to look at is your visual inspection. If you looked at the reason why we were carrying out storage, one of the reasons is that we want to maintain the quality of the product. We want to maintain the quality of the packaging. And when you want to start doing quality assurance, you have to start it at the beginning. When those products come, you need to look at them, look at their packaging and know that these things are okay before you even receive them. All right. So what is visual inspection? It is the process of examining products and their packaging to look for obvious problem with the product quality. Okay. So what when is it usually done? You do um, a visual inspection every time you receive products for the manufacturer, usually at the central level. Then each time the warehouse or the clinic receives supply, you have to do a visual inspection. You have to check that what is inside that, that carton corresponds with what is uh, the information on the outside. You need to do a visual inspection when you're doing a physical inventory. You need to see whether these use, units are usable or not. Then you need to do a, a visual inspection when you're investigating complaints or when the supplies are about to expire or when the supply shows signs of damage. So you need to do a visual inspection when you have physical inventory, when you're issuing, if you're receiving, and each time you suspect that is a problem with the quality of your product. So what do we look for when you are doing a visual inspection all right you want to look at the package you know you want to look at the package you want to look at the product integrity okay why do we want to look at the package we want to check for damages to package the packaging such as tears perforation whether there's water or oil leakage and you want to look at the products because you want to check whether the bottles are intact or whether some of them are broken, all right? You also want to look at manufacturing defects. You want to see whether the supply that they've given to you is complete. Sometimes you open a kit and I've seen that on one or two occasions on the bench. I opened a kit and I found out that one very important component is missing. That means I cannot carry out the test that is an incomplete supply you want to find out whether there's missing or illegible identification information please don't sit down and say i think this one belongs here i think this no the packaging must tell you all the information that you need to have then you want to look at the labeling you want to make sure that these products are labeled with the date of manufacture the expiry date the lot number the manufacturer's name everything must be on that packet, the lip must be well labeled. And then you want to look for missing contents of a kit. All right. Then you also want to check if there's a presence of <laughs> foreign matter inside the unit package. When I say foreign matter, dead rodents, you know, pests. Ah, a lot of things can be found that are not supposed to be there. Anything that is not supposed to be in that kit that you find inside there is a foreign matter. So you want to check that there's no foreign matter inside the unit package, all right? So having looked uh, at all these, you, I want you to answer this question for me. All right, so if uh, you were a manager that is um, in charge of commodities at the warehouse or the service delivery points, what would you do to minimize the consequences of storage problem discussed in the previous activities as we have seen? For me, I would um, routinely check, monitor the quality of the products I receive. I will periodically check the stock uh, shelves, all right? So if you do this, you will be able to notice any damage on time or kids that are supposed to expire that has not been used and you take care of those uh, problems. 
Uh, for the remaining little time, I'm going to take you on handling damaged products. There are protocols that are needed, national protocols actually, and procedures that should be followed for removal of damaged or expired commodities from the system. Like I told you before, you don't just carry damaged products and throw them away. No, 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 you don't do that. You will enter into very big problem. So the different program um, areas, your know, like your HIV AIDS, your malaria program, your medical health commodities and all that, they have different, you know, um, ways of getting rid of their expired uh, products for like, for instance, the HIV AIDS uh, logistic system, uh, what you use, you use the record for returning and transferring commodities. You use it to transfer uh, or return these unusable commodities back to the central as appropriate. Then for the malaria, you have to, for the uh, damaged product, what you do is that you write down the product name, the quantity and the expiration date, you register it and record it on a transfer memo and you send it back to the state CMS. Um, for medical laboratory commodities, because they are very wide in range, what we usually do is that we follow the manufacturer's guidance in the safety material data sheet and the national guidelines. So you have to be aware also that some of these laboratory materials contain cyanide. I've told you how very poisonous it is. They also contain other blood products, which we always consider as infectious. So you have very, very strict uh, disposal guidelines, which we use. And if you're not sure of the disposal uh, procedure, you seek guidance from the National Medical Laboratory Technical Working Group. So having said that, I actually want to thank you for being with us this long. I want to appreciate the United States Agency for the International Development, you say it and the support of the United States governments through the supply chain management system, both international and Nigeria. Uh, I also want to thank you, you are my MVPs, for being with me through all the modules. I want to actually thank you for your time and thank you for taking time to view these slides. All right, and for the feedback, both uh, lovely and uh, constructive feedback I've received from everybody okay though I, I have ended the module six i will be doing some short videos on um how to uh some calculations that may be a little bit hard for beginners to be able to do we'll go through them together on the videos and see how we can make that very simple for you they are very very short videos and they will help you with your calculations i'll just select some problems that i think are very, very difficult for you to do. And I will deal with them online so that you can watch the videos and then, you know, practice them um, on your own. So for the modules seven to 11, Dr. Ifi Marian Okafo will take it. I'm sure you will enjoy your time with her. She's a very technical person very detailed person and you will gain so much from her so here is her youtube link um i'm also going to put the youtube link down um in um the description box so that you can click on it directly and it will take you there so i want to thank you so much <laughs> please if you do have any questions write it down on the chat box and I'll get back to you. Or if you can't, get me personally. I will answer them. Take care. Bye-bye. <laughs> God bless. Bye.